On behalf of the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, I'd like to welcome you to the PBS CCS podcast. I'm your host, Chris Messina. guys this episode of the podcast is going to be another group episode i'm going to have the guys introduce themselves first and then we're just going to dive right in so we'll go trevor and then we'll go brian and we'll just we'll just go we'll let it roll uh how's it going trevor swartz i'm a coordinator with the colorado rockies this is my seventh season in pro ball fourth as the coordinator um living here currently in phoenix arizona and yeah yeah, right on. Um, I'm coming from Cooler Pastures up here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, worked in baseball uh, and MLB for about six years. Um, and now I am the director of sports at Sparta Science, where I've been in about three years. So I want to dive right in. We're going to talk force plays. We're going to talk jump testing. And like I said, off camera, selfishly, this is a really exciting episode for me because this is something that I've been trying to dive into in my own time. Uh, just get a better grasp of it. I think it's something that's coming coming along in the field. And I know in the past, force plates were really expensive and it was really hard to get info, but it seems like they're becoming more accessible and the info is uh, more user-friendly. So uh, to kick it off, just let's talk general force plate discussion, how you guys are testing, how often you're testing, the metrics you guys are using, really anything that you want to talk to get us started about force plates, and then we'll kind of dive in from there. Yeah, so for us, we've been partnered with Sparta Science for the last eight years. So for the seven years I've been with the Rockies, that's what we've been using has been force plate assessments on guys. Um, it started with basic Kistler plates, and it's progressed now to working with Burtek plates. Um, it went from us having three plates to now we have plates in every affiliate. So over time, it's been a lot easier process for us to get more assessments, um, get more scans, on guys and see kind of what the data is telling us. Um, for us, what we do with our guys is we jump every three weeks. Um, we're looking at what the adaptations are going to be in that three-week period from jump to jump. So what we do with guys is they jump six times on the plate, um, full counter movement jump with arm swing, and we'll take the three best jumps and we'll look at what the average of the eccentric rate of force development is, concentric rate of force development, and concentric impulse, which we've termed load, explode, and drive. So from that, we look at what guys are deficient in and how can we improve that deficiency and how guys are moving. So for us, it's every three weeks, we're going to assign you a program based off of what we've deemed important as far as what movements we are using and how is that impacting how you're moving overall. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's, that's well said, Trev. And I think it really, I think it differs every organization that you talk to. Um, anyone that's using force plates, I think the first question is why, what do you, what do you want to look at? Um, what metrics do you believe are valuable? Um, and also how can you not look at too much or how can you not be uh, someone trying to chase everything under the sun? Um, so really finding what you believe is important and what's going to support your mission and that should be helping the athletes. And I think, you know, Trev mentioned a, hey, every three weeks, we're going to scan, we're going to look at, okay, how has this last phase of training played out? What kind of adaptation has occurred? And I think that's valuable. I think where I've even seen more value, um, and, where I think a lot of teams are doing it now is they're looking at weekly trends. So they're looking at how have we adjusted from maybe a micro cycle and their periodization scheme. Um, are they adjusting from the workload of the previous week? Um, are we seeing huge dips, you know, for, almost from a readiness standpoint, looking at it from a weekly standpoint. Um, so from a performance standpoint, I think it's valuable to look, you know, every three weeks, every two weeks, every week to kind of look and see how guys are adapting um, and whatnot. Um, what we haven't really talked about yet, and we'll probably go into a little bit is more so people using them in force plates for return to play. Um, that's a huge value that I feel is underrated. And I probably didn't understand that very well until maybe my last couple years um, using them in baseball um, was really looking at normative data 
um, and understanding, okay, when something happens, because stuff's going to happen, people are going to get hurt. And then how can we look at how they're moving now during their rehab in, in comparison to their normative data? Um, and are they anywhere back in that range um, to push back to sport? Or are they still um, dealing with setbacks and struggling um, from different things? So there is a huge uh, piece of, you know, yes, there's a, there's a huge uh, performance component of using force plates. However, I feel like the, the return to sport is very underrated. Um, and so we mentioned, you know, if I want to do it every three weeks, great. I want, but a lot of what dictates that is the risk of the individual. Are you dealing with somebody that's been hurt um, frequently or someone that you deem high risk based off the vitals that you're looking at? And Trevor mentioned, um, you know, average eccentric rate of force, you know, that breaking component, um, or do you think, you know, other metric, whatever metrics you're looking at, do you believe that these are a little bit out of whack and that individual is at a higher risk? If so, you might want to push up that testing frequency to about, you know, a lot a little more frequently than not. And then the other thing to look at is if, you know, if you're just talking about baseball, that's one thing. If you're looking at other sports, which I've been lucky enough to work with at Sparta, you know, sports like football that are dealing with a lot more trauma you're going to see more physiological change over that short period of time and alteration of movement strategy so you might want to look at it more frequently not to identify so much performance but where they are acutely uh, compensating during that time because of being beat up whatever it may be so other sports that deal more with that so that's all going to dictate how often you want to look at it but I think ultimately at the end of the day you only want to test when you're willing to do something with the data I wouldn't just test to test or have a testing day for your athletes because they'll quickly go hey man I'm a lab rat when are you going to use this data on me so being transparent there with with how you use it and, and where it's going to go yeah, and I think, Brian, with that, it kind of goes back to how it used to be with us, which it used to be kind of like the stationary, you know, you jump and then you, you do the warm up, then you go jump and then you have the guys at the computer explain everything. And I think that just shows the process of how we've gone about it over the years is, you know, we started with almost a stationary thing. You'd have different coaches assigned in different areas to now where it's one coach, one athlete, they're going to do the whole thing with them. And our athletes, we've gotten to a place where they know exactly how to get prepped to go jump on the thing. They'll go jump with a coach and then that coach can do the assessment right there and explain it to them. So that just shows the whole process of everything. And if there's been a big change, I'd say that moving from station to station, having that old school testing approach, the battery of assessments, that's gone away to now where it's more of a intimate setting one-on-one -on -one with coach and athlete going through it all. No, totally. And Chris, you'll actually like this. Back back in the, the Rocky days when I was there, we used to say, uh, no jump, no pump. That was kind of the motto. <laughs> like, until we got some data on you, we couldn't, you know, we wanted to put together the best program that we could. Um, so you weren't going to lift until we got the data on you. So if we had a force plate there, we weren't going to lift without seeing what it said and, and obviously utilizing what we have. Um, but then, you know, as Trev touched on there, uh, you know, when guys did assess right after they assess in order to not feel like a lab rat, someone's got to explain to you, you know, what in the hell that means. And depending on what force plates you're using, you know, that could be more difficult to read than not. So what takeaways can the athlete take from, Hey, I just did my jumps. Now what, you know, so I think one thing that Trev mentioned there was the transparency with, the athletes you're working with, hey, because we saw this insert here, you might see more of this in your programming to work on this quality, whatever it may be, right? So just filling in the athlete why you did it, what you're looking at, and how it's going to impact them that way, you know, because as today is going and there's tech everywhere and everyone's using a little bit here and a little bit there to keep the athlete from feeling like they don't know where these numbers are going or what's being done with it, you can pretty much clarify right then and there what the approach is going to be. Yeah. And I think that goes with really anything, right? It's like you guys kind of both touched on it is when you get something new, you get really excited and you're like, yes, we're going to have everybody do this. And then you don't have a real reason why you just collect the data and it's just like, okay, now what, we, what do we do with it? And as Trev mentioned, like it's kind of a process of, 
okay, we are going to start here. We're going to keep this really simple. We're just going to get what we can that's usable, and then we'll expand on it versus like, hey, we got 60 pieces of data, but we don't know what to do with it. And I think that's a big issue that comes up um, really with any tech, but especially with force plates because they're kind of newer in the game. Um, and that's why I wanted to have you two on is because I know that you guys take that data and you use it for something with your athletes. Um, and so kind of give me an example um, of a guy, hey, he just force play tests, he shows deficiency in this, and this is how we're going to change your program, and these are the adjustments we're going to make. Yeah, so for us, kind of to go to the – I'm going to dial it back here just so I can explain our process and how we go about it and how it leads to that point with an athlete is – we meet twice a year and we evaluate what the in-season program was and then we'll evaluate what the off-season program was. So from there, we'll look at trends we saw, certain movements were having impact statistically on the uh, movement signature that guys are creating. Um, and we kind of have a meeting, closed door meeting for up to eight hours of deciding what movements are gonna impact what variables. So for us, it's been this seven year, eight year process of sitting in a meeting talking, having some very uncomfortable discussions about, you know, what we think would fit best in each category. And then assign, how would we assign that to an athlete and how would it look as a program? So it gets uncomfortable. The nice thing with us is having someone like Sparta to come in and consult with us and having that sounding board. So us being able to come with an idea and say, hey, we think doing speed work is going to improve explode. And them going, okay, well, we see X, Y, and Z. Well, we're not going to want to do X with our guys because that's not a movement or position that we want to put our athletes in over the course of a season. So we'll try something, a speed movement, and we evaluate it after six months and come to find out it's not improving explode, it's improving load dramatically. So that therefore then falls into this bucket of movements that we're going to use for load. So it's been this process to de define what we wanted. I think we've come to a good place of we know what our big three are for what we're going to program guys with squat, deadlift, split squat for load, explode and drive. And then the secondary and tertiary movements, we kind of, we have a pretty good idea about what fits in each category now to where when we do get to that point with an athlete, when they do scan and they come in and there is a scan change and we see something drop, we can have that discussion. Hey, you've been hammering split squats for the better part of the last three weeks and your drive's gone up dramatically. Now you're low explode. Now we're going to work on some speed movements. We're going to work on creating some time under tension. So that dialogue's changing. We're giving them that info. And then we're going into, hey, we're going to focus more on time under tension. You're going to, your first day is going to be deadlifts. And this is why. And this is the focus point. So it sets that. We have that transparency with the athlete. And then it just gives them that knowledge of, okay, now I have to do this. And this is my focal point for the next three weeks until I jump again. So it takes a lot of work on the front end of things to get everything kind of ready to go. And I think that's something that we ironed out over the years to now where it's a very streamlined process of we sit down and meet for a day back six years ago, it used to be like two to three days of meetings to where now it's, we know what we're looking at. We have a good idea of what we want and it's kind of more of little minute changes to the program. And then once we get to that sit down with the athlete, it just becomes a very easy dialogue with them and they pick up on it right away. No, totally. And that, that was well said, Trev. I, I think one, you know, if I were to take some things away from that, I think one thing you touched on was needs change. We change, right? Based on the stimulus, not just from the exercises in the weight room, but whatever we're doing away from the weight room or the sleep that we're getting, all the, all the variables go into play here. So needs change. You, what you, what you need today, you might not need in two weeks. Um, that's really the power of the objective data um, because our bodies change hourly, daily, let alone every couple of weeks. So the thought, the whole thought process of only doing one subjective test a year or two a year, thinking that those are still accurate at any point in the year is, is kind of far off unless it's, you know, an extreme situation. So needs change one, two, you talk about, you know, the philosophy for you guys at the Rockies is going to be different from probably every other club in the MLB. Everyone's got their own philosophy. Everyone has their own, you know, brand of training. Really, I think the idea and what you mentioned, Trev, is like explaining to the athlete 
what those variables are beyond the movement that you're doing to improve them. What is it and how does it relay to their sport? What, you know, how does that translate to the field? That's what they want to know. You know, I could talk about pitchers I've trained over the years. They could, they could give a rat's ass about being in the gym. They don't want to be in the gym, but if you can explain to them how this movement is going to impact their work on the mound, okay, that, that might help a little bit of buy-in. So now going back to that philosophy is being different. What you guys do um, to improve, you know, eccentric rate of force might not be what some other club might do. So understanding that concept of how that variable is manipulated and then understanding what kind of exercises that you guys like as a staff is going to fit into there is the key. So what the Rockies do is not the same as what, you know, someone else does, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, you have to know what, why you're testing, what that exercise is going to do and where it's going to go because, you know, Chris, to kind of to your point, it's selfish on as a practitioner to think that we're just going to test and eventually figure it out and then come back with a better plan. That does nothing for the athlete that you're working with today. You didn't do a damn thing for him. If you tested, you kept it in your back pocket and that never got relayed. So, at the end of the day, why are we in this? We're in it for the athletes we work with. We're in it because we love it, but there's gotta be a why behind all of it. And I think, you know, establishing those as a staff is huge. Um, and then just to get more into the details, because I hate listening to things when guys don't elaborate. So like uh, this and then this, I think is a big part of, of a lot of this data. I love, so, you know, we just got, you know, it's the NFL draft and we were just at the NFL combine we see a lot of these guys and we've seen this a lot. They're so extremely explosive and produce force so rapidly, um, twitchy, elastic individuals from a training standpoint, if I'm looking at these variables, if I'm looking at these force variables, I probably don't need to keep tapping into the stimulus of this just VBT um, reactive speed stuff that they get all the time. And whether that be skill work or, and, or the game, if there's something that I can tap into to help that individual, and in this case, oftentimes we see low concentric impulse or low drive, which is the ability to apply force over, you know, through deeper ranges over a longer period of time. So my head is going to go to, I don't want to keep hammering them with the same stimulus that they get all the time, that quick reactive um, short change of directions type stuff. I'm going to give them something they probably suck at and they probably don't like, and it's going to be, deeper ranges of motion training, okay, lifts that take longer to get through, require better form. They probably are a guy that has anterior tilt, so they're not very good at a lot of this stuff to begin with. They probably have terrible soft tissue um, quality in general. These are the trends I've seen over time. So I want to have something where you have a plan daily for soft tissue work because you're probably really stiff and tight. And two, I want to put you in these deeper ranges of motion in your training process. And three, I want to stay away from the one thing or the couple of things that probably feed those higher variables that you have and can now feed your lowest variable. So that's the math I'm doing in my head of if I see this, I want to do this and I can go a lot of ways with that on a lot of different variables, but hopefully that was just one example. Are you guys seeing differences, um, Trevor specifically in baseball with like position to position and then Brian just, you know, sport to sport are, uh, are people looking at different variables on the force plates and then even within the sport itself are different variables kind of playing into the programming or is it better to have, you know, these set variables and then we adjust per position. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think, and it goes back to what we talked about earlier and Brian brought it up is, you know, keeping it simple. I think us looking at three variables, it simplifies the approach to where we're not concerned about all the external noise going on. So what we've seen is canonically over time is you see certain types of trends, certain type of movement signatures based off a of guy's positions. Like, for example, with the catcher, we're going to see guys with higher eccentric rates of force development. Why? They're squatting consistently. Um, so you see positionally guys and how they move in a game. That's typically going to outweigh a lot of the training that we're going to do with guys. The training is meant to offset what's going on in the game. So with a catcher, what are we trying to do? He's stuck in a short squatty position all the time. We're going to try and lengthen him out, you know, get him on a good soft tissue routine. He's going to be banged up, most banged up on the team kind of like a football player, you want to give him that soft tissue routine and try and lengthen him out a little bit. 
work on those longer style movements so he's not all scrunched down all the time. With a middle infielder, what we've seen is typically they're high explode guys. So they're the guys who quick twitch side to side lateral movers. You know, they probably need a little bit of dose of both. You need a little bit of strength, you need a little bit of unilateral training to get going. So it's trying to find and you look and see these different positions and what guys kind of bucket into. And that's what we've seen over time is these different categories come up and now we can look at a guy based on his position. Okay, we think this, but he might be an outlier. So there are going to definitely be outliers there. But on the whole, we generally see these things kind of show up over time and it's a simple approach. We're not trying to overcomplicate it. Yeah, definitely not overcomplicating it. And I like, I brought in football to throw some color at this because I feel like we think that these are like so different, right? Just because they're different skill sets, you know, I think really, you know, we're looking at movement as a whole universally and across sports, you may see, in my experience, you may see different trends, you know, positionally and through different, uh, different sports. But what we tend to see are the same similar types of injuries um, across different sports if they have the sim same movement pattern. So, you know, for example, uh, you know, a stiff athlete in baseball or a very rigid, good change of direction guy, maybe a center fielder, maybe a shortstop, that overall stiffness of that trunk, you know, in a rotary sport, especially we tend to see more obliques or labral hip. We see the same thing in, in NFL. We see the same thing in NBA. When guys are too stiff, they tend to rely on the same mechanisms to produce force, um, regardless of sport. So now there's going to be more obliques in baseball because it's rotary as opposed to some of these other ones. But the idea of where they draw that energy from or how they sequence is kind of typically going to be their weak spot as far as being exposed to specific types of injuries. Um, so, and you can really, you know, obviously people that have force plates, you know, sometimes if, if a guy does a jump, they're looking at 150 variables. So people out there are looking at far beyond, you know, what Trev is talking about, what I'm talking about, um, and, you know, potentially with some success, I'm not sure. Um, I think if you look at, you know, a lot of the literature and a lot of the main body of research, you're going to see a lot of the same ones, that don't, uh, you know, that people dive into. For example, um, what we're talking about is load at Sparta Science, we call it load. Essentially, that's, you know, average eccentric rate of force. You might also hear that referred to as the breaking phase. So, however, there's different nomenclature, and that's kind of one of the problems is that people call them different things, but really people are looking at the same phase of the jump. Um, same thing, you know, Sparta calls it explode. Uh, you may see that as the propulsive phase um, in, in some of the literature. Um, but really, you know, more so than, um, you know, than, than asymmetries and right and left, what we're trying to understand and what we have seen be extremely meaningful in the research is um, looking at eccentric to concentric um, differences and discrepancies throughout a movement, we've seen there be a, a lot of meaningful information there. Um, and that's where, you know, the breaking proposal, those are just being different phases of that movement. So depending on what you're looking at, you can definitely find a lot, I think, just continue to keep it consistent and look at the same variables. And then you're going to be able to glean some insight at what changes those variables. In terms of testing, do you guys have certain cues that you use or anything? I know, Trevor, you said you do counter movement jumps and maybe, Brian, you've seen some other like uh, a drop a drop jump um, or like a counter movement rebound. Is there differences in the testing? And I'll give you some background to this. So in spring training this year, I was kind of messing with our force plates. And every day before I would lift, I would do the same routine, you know, and then I would jump and I would do the six counter movement jumps and the first three – I would do very quick, just high hips, just boom, boom, and then, you know, take my rest. And then the second three, I would do almost like a deep, like full astagrass squat and jump. Um, and I got probably two or three weeks of data. I just got the data back the other day, and I was just kind of looking through the differences between the jumping strategies. Um, do you find that you have to set, like, a, say, a set hip height? Um, for the jumps or do you let the guys just kind of jump however do you give them certain cues so that everybody has the same kind of you know idea in mind in terms of like hey try to dunk a basketball right here or something along those lines try to be as explosive as possible just how are you kind of uh, working through that because the, the thing for me is 
um, like a, a drop jump test, like some guys might not be comfortable with that. They might not be prepared for that. And we might actually be putting them, you know, at a risk of injury where Trevor, like a counter movement jump, most guys should know how to at least jump somewhat. I would think the more they test, the more frequently, the more comfortable they get with it. And maybe they're fine, their strategy that works for them. Um, so in a roundabout way, are you kind of setting a set standard of, dr of jump protocol procedure or are you just kind of giving cues so that everybody has the same image in their mind? Yeah, so for us, it's we do the counter movement jump. So for us, it's guys come in, they do their soft tissue routine. We have now an inside activation series or warm up, we call them. Um, guys go through a warm up and then you get on the plate. I don't cue guys on the plate. All we do is tell guys we have a nice big ceiling. I just tell guys, hey, try and touch the ceiling. Like that's the only cue I'm going to use with guys. I want to see how they move on their own without any cueing. I think that eliminates a lot. It keeps it as simple as we can. I think that's kind of the meat and potatoes of what we do is we just want it to be as simple as they can so then we can see exactly what we want, it. like what is going to be the movement outcome there. So I know Sparta, they do a lot of stuff there, testing a lot of things. Brian's going to speak probably a lot more about that than I can. But for us, it's we're not going to cue guys. I want to just see how you're moving at that point in time. I want that snapshot right there. And I'm not going to cue you. It's on you. Yeah. And, you know, I think it, it all goes back to the reliability of the data and what Trev is talking about and, and, and kind of what you're talking about too, Chris, is repeating that process. You're like, you know, I come in, I do this, I do this every time. You're standardizing it. So the way that you do it every time is the way that you're going to be able to understand change better. Um, so standardization is such a overlooked part of the equation that it's actually, um, it's hard to, like, if people are doing it differently everywhere, how are we going to understand the information? Or how can we understand what's the best thing to do or the best information? So standardization, whether that be the specific warm up you do or the time of day, whatever you can, try and keep it the same as much as you can. Um, and then you'll, you can compare that information pretty well. Um, as far as cues go, you know, Trev mentioned, I don't want to give him any cues. I just want to tell him jump as high as I can. Really, that allows the athlete to do what they need to do without thought and or butchering it. Because the more cues you give, the more they will butcher it. Or they won't repeat it the same way the next time they do it if you didn't give them the cue. So the more cues you give, the more they think, the more they do it differently each time, the less accurate or reliable that data is going to be. And as they say, garbage in, garbage out what does it even matter if it's just numbers that don't mean anything, right? So um, the standardization piece is boring and it's a nerdy thing to look into, but I think it's really important to start there and make sure that everything is standardized and it's reliable and then you can actually glean some good information. You know, you talked about the, um, you know, drop jump or anything like that. And those are commonly used tests and there's a lot of merit to a lot of those tests. Um, again, I think, you know, like RSI is a, a hot topic right now. And, and we've talked about this before, but if you're doing, you know, dropping off a box to do RSI, you know, what are you telling the athlete? And maybe I'll, maybe I'll ask what you would, what you would ask an athlete, but are you telling them to be as quick as they can off the ground? Or are you telling to them to jump as high as they can? Yeah. See, for me, that's, that's where my, my thoughts on this go. And, like I said before, I don't have a ton of uh, use with the force plates, but for me, there is like a neurological jumper and like a muscle driven jumper. And for me, I'm a muscle driven guy. So if I do, you know, like a drop jump test for me, I think of, Hey, I need to hit the ground and go versus like be as quick as I can. I feel like when I cue myself to be quick off the ground, I actually lose some of my height and my jump and some of the power out of my legs versus if I tell myself, you know, hit the ground and push into it hard. And so I think that goes back to what you're saying. And that's kind of why I asked this question is like, does the cueing actually give us, you know, false reads on things? And I think it does. And for me, like you guys said, the less cues I give, the less an athlete has to think about things and the more we just let them do it organically the better information we get. And the, that's where the coach's eye comes in for me is if you can watch, um, I was listening to Bob Alejo speak and he was talking about force plates and 
they had a return to play with this kid and he was jumping and he said a jump PR and everybody was happy. And he's like, but did you look at his strategy? His strategy was different the first time he did it versus this time. So he used a different strategy and he was coming back from a hamstring and he was using a quad dominant jump. So his hamstring, he was actually protecting himself using a different strategy and it worked for a jump PR, but in the long term of his progression, he wasn't ready to play yet because uh, the hamstring was obviously being compensated for. So for me, I, I honestly, I do think that the cueing that we give, we can actually give too much and, and give guys the wrong information. So that's why, like I said, for me, I did the, the three jumps that were just quick and I did the three jumps that were longer, deeper, more muscle driven. And, you know, my, my data was different and yeah. which one yeah. I want to use. I mean, it depends. And so it, it makes me nervous if you standardize like a set hip height that, hey, you might miss out on this information for this guy because he's actually, you know, a quick jumper. He doesn't need to go that low or this guy actually needs to go a little lower, but we're not allowing him because his hip height is too high. So for both of you, you 100%. know, you guys said like, hey, just watch the athlete. And that's where the coach's eye comes in. And Trevor, it's cool that you guys have one at every affiliate because your coaches just get reps with it. And I'm sure they can pick things up like that and see that kind of stuff. One thing about it too. Go ahead. go ahead, Trev. No, go ahead. I was just gonna say back to the RSI. You're you're literally gonna get two different results. To jump higher, you have to impart force for longer on the ground to do so, and that's gonna be pretty much the exact opposite as being as most as reactive as you can. You're gonna get two different results, and so I think again, not a bad test. I'm not harping on the test. Um, I think there's merit to it when it's repeated you know, the same way each time. And that's hard. That's the hard part is we deal with life in the real world. We're not in a lab. That's the thing. It's like, we are all working with real people, real world, things go wrong. People come in not wanting to do what you ask them to do. Um, so how can I make it as easy as possible? And if they're confused about what the end goal is, you're going to get different results. And if the next time they come in that thought process, again, they could do it differently you know, it doesn't, it's just a lot of variables going to play. Again, how can we standardize it as best we can? The jump is a highly done thing because it doesn't take skill. And if it takes a skill out of it, then we can take that out and really analyze the force trials. And I think one thing that, you know, one thing that Sparta does really well is if you do six jumps and let's say you're somebody that is trying to alter it or do something different or you recue different, it's going to take and analyze the top three jumps. We want to analyze those trials. They're going to probably be most indicative of, of your most natural movement pattern. So it's going to kick those other ones out that you were trying to do something weird. So we're not even going to look at those. So I think that's one, one way that you can use software to your advantage is try and kick out the noise, as Trev said, and really focus on what's important. So, um, you know, that in, there, was, there was a webinar we did yesterday, and, and two of the smartest people I've ever been around, you know, Bryce Patterson and, and Phil Wagner, were talking about um, the difference between research and stuff done in labs and the real world application and practicality. They're two quite separate things. Um, and so thinking that because we read a research paper or saw this study, that this is how it played out, that it's going to actually work that way for you and, and your population and where you're at, uh, you know, it could be pretty far off with that assumption. So what is practical? What can you do frequently? And where can they not cheat it? And that's, those are things you need to focus on. So go a little further with that. I know you mentioned in the real world, there are guys that don't want to do certain things. Um, so what kind of challenges are you guys facing? Or maybe um, Trev, like when you first started implementing the force plate stuff with the Rockies, like what kind of challenges were you guys facing or any backlash from the athletes? And how do you deal with that? I know you mentioned like, hey, we sit down, we explain it to them. Um, but maybe in the beginning, you weren't doing that. So how did you kind of get through that uh, with those guys? Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a long, arduous process for us. And Brian can attest to the early years of this. Um, going through it initially, it was hard. I mean, you're telling guys, hey, we're not going to do our old assessments on you. We're going to put you through. You're going to jump six times on a plate. So I think the biggest thing early on was you had guys that had been around pro ball for a while. And you're like, hey, we're going to just 
jump test do you want to play? And they're like, well, that's going to tell me everything I need to know. And you have to sit down and explain it to them. And I think it's that whatever's new, people get really turned off by it. So I think for us, the early issues were getting guys to even jump. I mean, we were lucky to get maybe one a month on guys. And that came with us not having force plates in every affiliate. It came with some hardware issues because of the travel of the force plates. Um, so it led to all these different kind of issues that came up. And so over the years, I think the things we realized was putting our emphasis on educating players as to why. Why are we doing this? What, why is this so important for guys? So when it started really with these new guys coming in, of uh, being hands-on with them, really educating them on – okay, you're going to jump on this. This is why. And so we have this whole kind of onboard education process for our players that go through once they get drafted. And any new free agent guy, we kind of have this script now written where, okay, this is why we do it. We're going to go through this. You're going to be one-on-one with the coach. You're going to go jump. You're going to come in. We're going to explain it to you. This is why we're looking at these things. We're trying to eliminate all of that external stuff that goes on. So early on, it was getting guys to even jump to where now it's, I think the issue we have now is because of our movements that we've looked at over the years and we've determined work for these variables. um, It's the complaint about not having the variety and to which we're learning to tell guys, Hey, I don't want you to be mediocre at 20 different movements. I want you to be great at these six, because if you're great at these six, this is the carryover it's going to have on your performance and on the field. So it's, you're having to re-educate these guys and it's all these new issues that come up. I mean, seven years ago, the battles we were fighting were, you know, getting guys to jump on a plate to where now it's guys asked to jump sometimes once a week and you just say, yeah, let's go. And now it's, they complain about the variety. So it's just one thing after another, you're training one for another, but there's ways around it. So I think we've, we're aware enough of what's going on with guys to adjust to the times and, make those adjustments happen in real time. And the nice thing about us meeting twice a year is we can air all this out and we can get it all out as a staff and we identify the issues, we fix it, and we go into the next phase, the next six months of the season or off season with a clear plan and we'll adjust accordingly going off of that. So um, early on, getting guys to jump was the biggest one. And I think it just, it came from a lot of education, a lot of uncomfortable, hard discussions with players, staff. I mean, it was, it was this whole long process to where now it's, well, we don't do enough movements. Well, this is why we do these movements. Like, I want you to be good at these six, not mediocre at the 20 that you would do otherwise. So it's, it's been an evolution over the years. <laughs> yeah, I think change is a bitch. Honestly, no one likes change. And they're going to, they're gonna, even if it's best for them and they know it, they're still going to fight you um you know luckily it's a little bit more the norm back in you know the end of 2012 and 2013 we're trying to get guys to jump on force plates in the MLB that was a little bit of a that was random and they had never seen that before so of course why aren't we doing curls bro um because we don't want you to jump on this plate well how's it going to help me hit tanks bro um okay so you have to get back to the beginning of like your understanding of why it's being done. And if change is hard, but it's harder to get somebody to change. If one, I don't have a clear understanding of what I'm trying to get out of this test and two, how I can relay to them why it's important. It all comes back to education. So Trev is talking about some of those meetings that were hard to deal with and long hours in in a room with closed doors that was really getting to the bottom of why are we doing this and what are we looking at and how does this help us? Um, So educating um, externally in your athletes starts with being educated internally and why you're doing something and, and being able to explain it. So when you're looking at um, several, if not, you know, tens, 20, 30 variables, I, I don't know how to explain that to somebody and how they all relate because a lot of times in, you know, sports science, quote unquote, you can get married to variables and you can get married to things that you think are important. But I think at the end of the day, you have to take a step back and how do they relate to each other? What is that relation? When one goes up, what happens to the other one? And where is the compensation? So if I can look at a few that I deem important and I understand really well, that's great. And I think, you know, if Trev talks about the early years, 
I'll be transparent with you. I didn't know what I was looking at. It took me a while to learn it, but the way that I learned it um, was getting my hands dirty, like you're talking about and jumping on there yourself and then seeing what changes happen, training, assessing again, seeing what changes happen. So when I got to go to explain it to somebody, I've done it before. I've seen the changes. I'm aware of what I'm talking about. Um, instead of kind of being in a, uh, you know, an ivory tower or something where I'm not getting my hands dirty, I'm not training, I'm not looking at these things. And then I got to explain it to a guy fresh out of high school that we just drafted or a Latin American player that we just drafted. Um, you know, it's not going to happen. So education, first and foremost, internally is going to create this atmosphere and this buy-in externally, um, regardless of how hard or abrupt the change might be. Yeah, for me, looking at my jump data, it was really cool to compare the notes from my own lifting program, my own conditioning program, and, and compare it to those jumps. And you know, it worked out really well that I had deloaded and I saw the numbers and they were, you know, they were going up and then I hit a, a bench PR right before I left. And um, so for me, it was cool to be able to kind of sit down and really compare. Um, and like I said, I was jumping every day, but I didn't look at the day to day. I didn't change my, my lifting program. And I know some people are using jumps for readiness and they're making adjustments. Um, but I was more in the boat of what Trevor is talking about is I just jumped and then I looked back at the data and I looked at my program and I evaluated from there and it worked out well for me. And I think there's a lot of merit in just taking the time and just, you know, messing with the force plates yourself, even if you don't know what you're doing or what you're looking at, like it can help you kind of sift through some things. No, totally. Yeah. And you had a plan at least you had a plan of what you wanted to do with it and when you wanted to retouch on it. Um, and I, I won't go down this rabbit hole, but the whole like thing I saw on like, in Twitterverse last year about like, should strength coaches train? Do they need to train? I think the answer is yes. You have to be in it. You need to be doing it. You need to feel it. You know, this is like, you know, I get it if you're of old age, okay, you're not training anymore, but you've had your hands dirty. Um, so much of it comes from being vulnerable to what you don't know. And if you're not willing to put yourself or expose yourself, you're never going to improve. You're never going to learn something new. So you got to expose yourself. You got to look stupid sometimes. I had to ask questions back in the day that now I think are pretty easy questions, but is looking stupid in front of a group to ask that question, um, which we don't do enough. And those uncomfortable meetings that Trevor talks about were meetings where you look stupid, where you ask a question and we're like, dude, were you listening? What are we, what are we talking about right now? So like the, and so much in the industry, and, and I say the industry because I've been in it for a long time is this no one not, I wouldn't say no one not enough people have this vulnerability to be wrong or to change their direction when they've done it incorrectly um, and really a lot of that just comes from getting your hands dirty and and doing it incorrectly yourself before you do it correctly before you can relay that to your athletes etc cetera, etc cetera. so I won't go down that rabbit hole but we could <laughs> well and that's what we do now I mean bringing in new coaches you're bringing in guys either from the college sector other teams private industry you're bringing in these coaches with different backgrounds and for us as a staff our rule is like you have to go through our two-week onboard process so you go through this work ramp it builds you up it teaches you it educates you on the whole system and going to brian's thing is like educating your staff internally and then also putting it in practicality these guys are training our movements every day these guys we're cueing them in our movements probably for two to three hours a day throughout this whole thing they're jumping every day they're seeing how their scans are changing on a day-to-day -day basis based off of the training they're doing. So any new coach that comes into our system, you're jumping in right away, feet first into the deep end, and it's, it's go, 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 and you're learning the system. You're learning the processes that we've put in place, but also you're learning and seeing how the athletes are feeling. Because if you don't have that, then how are you going to tell a guy, hey, I need you to do a rear foot elevated split squat? He's going to tell you no. If he doesn't see you doing it or if he doesn't know that you can explain to them why they're doing it. And I think that's the yeah. other thing is coaches need to, that ego needs to get out the door and you got to put yourself yeah. in the athlete's shoes. I mean, that's the biggest thing yeah. for me is I'm reading a lot into marketing right now. And it's how do you get on someone's level to sell your product? That that's really the root of it. Get to their level so they can listen to what you're saying and they buy into what you're doing. Yeah. And I take it back to like being injured. When do you learn the most? 
you learn the most when you get injured and you have to like rehab your way out of it. That's when you learn a lot about yourself. I probably have more experience there the most. <laughs> uh, but like, I've, you know, like you learn from being wrong and, and getting yourself back on the right track and doing something, you know, to, to fix your route. Um, so it's really the same thing, man. Yeah, every year I have at least one time during the season where my low back just does not feel tremendous. And for me, like, that's a perfect opportunity to learn because these guys are going to come in and be like, dude, my low back is smoked today. What can you show me to help me? And it's like, if I've never gone through it myself, and I'm in the same boat, man, I, I do think we should train. And honestly, part of the fun is like being your own guinea pig. And it's, it's frustrating when you, you know, you put this perfect program together and you run through it and then like, you don't get results and you're like, well, shit, my numbers didn't go up. I didn't improve. But at the same time, you learn something that, hey, if it didn't work for me, it's probably not going to work for my athletes. So let's scratch that and do something different. So I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because we'll be here for another two hours. There is a rabbit hole that I do want to go down. Um, in terms of the data, how much are you guys sharing with the sports staffs? Trevor, obviously with the baseball coaches and then Brian, when you go in and consult with professional teams or teams all over the world, like how much of that is involving the sport coaches as well? I think the thing for us is with the onset of all this technology coming into baseball, you're starting to see more coaches that are taking a very big interest in what we're doing on the performance side. So they're wanting to see, you know, how our guys moving because that's impacting how they're coaching them. So the nice thing about us is we have very – forward thinking coordinators and coaches that come in and say, Hey, how's this guy moving right now? And we'll go through and we'll sit down and I'll explain it to them. And our hitting coordinator does a great job. We've been doing this for three years. Usually after our first round of tests and spring training, he comes in and we sit and talk about every guy. And it's this whole collaborate. Hey, I see this. What he goes, I see this with him. What do you see? I said, well, I see the same thing based off of this. This is objective. You're seeing it with the eye test. And so it's a very good process where these coaches are now coming into us and saying, okay, we're seeing this with the guy. What do you see? And we're able to pull up their signature and go, Hey, we're seeing this. It kind of, it's pretty much the same. And so that tie in now it's, we're able to relate from what they're doing with us on the performance end of it onto what they're doing on the actual sport end of it. So it's been a process to get there. Um, I think with everything coming in now, you're, coaches are very, very open to all this new technology and want to have these discussions and dialogues. Yeah. Um, and I would say, you know, from being around on other organizations and whatnot, it, it is, it is rare um, for the sport, sport coaches to really dive into it. It takes time. I think in the Rockies experience, success, success, success weighed on the sport coaches. When they started seeing results um, from a health standpoint, they bought into it more. So sometimes it takes that trust, obviously, before they start listening. But a lot of it's how you relay it. Um, there, If I sit in the room with a sport coach and I talk about, hey, hey, this pitcher has great average eccentric grade of force. He produces about 4,800 newtons of force. They're going to look at me and go, get the hell out of the room. And this isn't for you. But if I can relay that in a sense or a fashion that they can understand how that, you know, relays to their, you know, uh, sport or how they produce force on the mound, they're going to ask more questions and then therefore we can have a better conversation. So the, again, the more we can educate and relay this in layman terms and, and understand this, whether it's the athlete or the coach, the more they're going to ask more about that. Um, and so I know the Rockies had a really good buy-in from the coaches about, you know, specifically an example I'd make is, um, you know, load or um, eccentric rate of force and how a pitcher can produce force into the mount. Um, not a far off concept to grasp. Um, for a sport coach. So how can we improve this? Where do they struggle at it? Um, from a mechanic standpoint, all of that, it all ties together. It's just finding that, 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 um, that hallway you can stand in and understand both sides of it. So it's, it's not where it needs to be. I'll say that it, it needs, and it, it's going to, you know, every sport coach now has a Fitbit or something that monitors what they're doing. Right. So this, it's progressively getting in a better position where sport coaches are understanding, you know, 
their load, their work, what they're doing, sleep, all that. So naturally they're going to have more of an interest in what the athletes are doing now, but until show them why it matters first and then they'll listen. But until then we're kind of, we're not in the best spot. We can only improve. Um, but certain organizations, I will say, I you know, spoke with a college last week. They have what they call care meetings and they have the physical performance coach, the athletic trainer, um, physical therapist and the sport coach all in a room together. Um, like more than quarterly, I think it's, you know, a handful of times a year, whatever it is. And so when they're in those meetings, they actually do go over force plate metrics, um, but they're, they're spit out in a digestible fashion. So they start to care about it as they understand how it relays to the field. Yeah. I think for me, that's the biggest thing is making it digestible. And like you said, whether it's the coaches or the athletes, like, if you're telling an athlete the numbers and you're just reading them straight off of his readout, he's going to be like, dude, I don't, I don't care about this. What are you telling me? But if you can make it so that it relates to what he's doing, hitting, pitching, fielding, base running, they're going to be bought into it. And over the long term, like Trevor said, they're going to want to jump more because they're going to hopefully see, hey, my numbers are improving on here and my numbers are improving out there. And that's how you get that buy-in. But if you're just dropping big scientific words because you want to sound like you're smarter than them and you know what you're talking about, you've probably lost most of them, to be honest. 100%. And then how can you find these metrics? And, and we've been lucky at Sparta to work with some universities, and we've actually done in-game performances in relation to their force metrics. So we've done things we're looking at. Um, prediction of fastball speed by force production and, and put in the plate, which makes sense. Um, and then we've done other ones in the past um, with university where we looked at, you know, impulse or that drive variable and the ability to, you know, opposite field hits and that ability to produce force for a longer period of time and looking at guys who could pull the ball with a lot of power, having higher force numbers, like these things, if you can relate it to the game, it's not only going to help with the athlete that you're working with to buy in, but you're going to get those sport coaches here too. And they're going to want to know more about it. And really at the end of the day, we should care more about that. We don't want to know. We don't, we shouldn't care more about the one rep max our guy had this week. We should care about how many tanks he hit this week though. And if we can influence that on how we help them load and how we help them move, then that's pretty damn cool. And that's why at the end of the day, ultimately why we're in this. Yeah, right on. So where are you guys going um, for continuing ed on force plates? I mean, obviously, you guys are well versed in what you're doing. Um, but where are you going to learn more about force plates? Are there other people you're speaking to or listening to speak? Are there books you're reading, uh, websites you're checking out? Where are you guys going to keep yourself sharp? Yeah, so I think, and this is going to be something that's kind of a, it's a touchy issue right now. Um, there's not a whole lot of communication going on about force plates and I think it was kind of leading into this podcast you and I have talked about it Chris is you know who's willing to talk about it and I think that's one of the underlying issues is that you know it's this tool that I think a lot of people have and I think it's it's we're not doing a good enough job of talking about it and seeing what other people are doing like you hear whispers and rumors about what certain people are doing but as far as us talking about it and learning through each other I think that's where it we need to do a better job of. Um, Sparta does a really good job of putting out stuff. Um, I've read a little bit of Matt Jordan stuff, but I think on the whole, like we as a profession that people that are using them, we need to do a better job of talking to each other. I think that's one of the reasons why I was very excited to do this is we're having an opportunity to talk about this and at least put it out there and, you know, get a discussion going with people. Yeah. I agree with you, Trev. It's, it's kind of, if you're on your own on this, you're on your own. There's not a lot out there to look at, to be honest. Um, you know, it's, uh, I wish, in, uh, you know, it's a piece of hardware. Force plate is just hardware. Let's not forget that. It's the interpretation that matters. If we could, you know, if people were talking about how they're using it more frequently, um, what they're doing with their return to play considerations, stuff like that, that's, that's what I'm interested in. Um, as far as just what variables are you looking at, that's not as relevant as a conversation to me. Um, Cause we can, you know, we can do whatever we want on a force plate. And I've seen, you know, several force plates used for like 60 different movements and um, 
it can get really confusing really quick. I think at the end of the day, it comes back to what we touched on earlier, simplicity and how can we find um, simple interpretation for guys like all of us that, um, that work with athletes and don't necessarily have a lot of time to be crunching numbers and looking through stuff and, and learn our, these other things that you might have to do. If you have the time, great. Um, if you don't have the time, I think what we're all in, intrigued by and interested in for the health of our athletes is the interpretation of the data. And I wish I had a better answer for you, Chris. I just, there's not a lot, um, you know, I can speak on Sparta's behalf. We, we have some resources and especially some ones we put out in the last couple of months that are pretty good. Um, other than that, yeah, like Trev mentioned, there's a few people that are putting out some information. Um, there's a lot of um, asymmetry work done, you know, Chris Bishop, uh, Paul Comfort uh, in the UK, I believe they're both there. Um, so guys like that are doing some, some research and I think it's important again to look at those, look at those, uh, you know, learning anything from Bryce yesterday when I listened to this podcast or webinar was, you know, looking at the methods, the research, how it was done. The conclusion is not always the results that were found. So sometimes those things might be hard to sift through what was actually done, what they actually found, and then what they'd say is the results or conclusion could be two different things. So unfortunately, it's kind of the wild west of, of you know, a lot of times looking at some of the research and data, but I would love uh, if you're starting a club, on interpretation, um, <laughs> I support this. So I, I just, I just wish, in general, you know, just across the board, that we all were more vulnerable in, the, in this aspect and shared a lot more of what we're seeing and how we're using it. Because I think that's really what's going to help. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing for us, kind of piggyback off of that, Brian, is it's it's a piece of hardware, and it's we keep it simple. And I think the biggest thing it's given us time as coaches, more time with our athletes, more time with our other co the sport coaches themselves to actually have more in-depth discussions. We're not running six batteries of tests or doing, you know, six hour workouts or whatever. It's, it's a simplified process to where our time is better spent elsewhere to where we're actually able to communicate with the people that actually matter that we're actually working with and trying to help. That's, I think at the end of the day, that's really what it's going to come down to is using this piece of hardware to help them and influence and drive the, our decision-making process to keep them on the field, but also to spend more time with them to make sure that happens. Guys, this has been really awesome. And selfishly, like I said, I was really, really looking forward to this one. It definitely did not disappoint. And uh, so, you know, you guys talk about, hey, there's not a lot of people putting the info out. You guys are the ones putting the info out. So if I really do start a club of interpretation, you guys are going to be the president and the vice president or the sole president. <laughs> However you guys want to duke it out, you guys are going to be my guys. Um, I can't thank you enough for coming on and being so open and honest with me and, and just sharing your thoughts. And it, like you guys said, this is something that's it's kind of the wild, wild west, and it's an exciting time because people are using them. Um, and it's also a frustrating time because, you know, the, the people are hesitant to put it out there because they think they have, you know, the next big thing or the secret. And so for you guys to come on and, and be so open with me and share with me, it's, it means a lot to me. And I really do appreciate you guys coming on. Absolutely. You're welcome. Absolute yeah. pleasure, man. We appreciate it. All right, everybody, that concludes this episode with Trevor and Brian. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. As I said, selfishly, I was really, really excited for this episode, uh, and I'm really glad that they shared all the information that they did, and hopefully this will open up some conversations with other coaches in the future. Three things that I took from the guys in this episode, be transparent with your athletes about the data that you are collecting, know why you are using technology, and try to relate the info to how it will help the athlete in their sport. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll talk to you again on the next one. <music>